we're invited today to come and gaze and respond. We're going to take some time today to gaze into the face of Christ, to even look into the tears of Christ to see its meaning for us today. I want to welcome you. And I, and I never know what to say. It's not really happy Good Friday, uh, but it is, a, it is a good Good Friday because although the day that was so bad for our Savior is so good for us, and we're here today and we're worshiping our Savior, and this is all good. We're here today uh, to gaze into the face of Christ and see the tears of Christ. Uh, During this Holy Week series, we've been looking at, we started on Sunday, looking at the tears of Christ. On Palm Sunday, we looked at the tears of Christ that he shed uh, as he was overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And he shed tears because he understood that so many would reject him as Messiah and that the destruction of the city would, would, uh, would follow 40 years later. And he saw the pain uh, that unbelief and sin and judgment brings into the lives of, of, of people. And so he shed tears of sorrow. We're going to look today into the eyes of Jesus and see the tears of suffering that he shed for us on, on Gethsemane and on the cross and understand what that means for us today. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to continue to look in Jesus, at Jesus and see the tears of sympathy that he shed uh, as he stood at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus who had died. Tears of sympathy identifying with the suffering of those who have lost loved ones, knowing that he would, he would raise up Lazarus from the dead as a demonstration of his power uh, to raise people from the dead and showing us what he will do one day for us. So I hope that you'll want to come back on Easter Sunday to see that hope that Jesus brings in bringing the resurrection to us today. That's what we celebrate in this Holy Week, our Jesus who is a Savior and who demonstrates himself to us in so many ways. But today we focus on the tears of Jesus that he shed on this, this time of suffering from late Thursday into Friday that we call Good Friday. And I've been thinking about tears over this last week, doing a little bit of research and thinking about it, and I've just come to the conclusion that everything about God's creation is awesome, and human tears are amazingly awesome. They're the handiwork of our Creator God. I've been doing a little reading on the biology of tears, and uh, I, I shared with you uh, on Sunday that there are three kinds of tears. I didn't know that, but you know, three functional tears. There's basal tears, which care for the cornea. And, and we have tears in our eyes all the time, protecting our eyes. We just don't know it. There are reflex tears, which guard against irritants. We're constantly blinking and trying to protect our eyes. And th- that's what some of those tears are for. But we, we know emotional tears, right? Um, and many of us men say, no, I don't know anything about that. But there are those emotional tears that we shed at different times. Those are the tears that we often think of. And these are the tears that we're going to look at of Jesus today. In fact, some scientists say that the tears we cry when we're feeling strong emotions contain hormones and proteins that aren't present in the tears that protect our eyes. So God knows that we need a special kind of help And those tears that we shed in those emotional times have extra help for us um, with hormones and proteins to protect our eyes. And and I also didn't know that human tears are covered by an oily outer layer that keeps the tears smooth enough to see through it. Just God is just amazing, isn't he, in the way that he has designed our world and our lives. Those are just some of the amazing facts about the biology of tears. But I know you didn't come here for that. You would have turned on the Discovery Channel if you wanted that. Um, But when I think about tears, I I also think about the way in which tears speak. Maybe we'll call that the psychology of tears. And Washington Irving, the American author uh, from the 19th century, wrote, there is a sacredness in tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. And as we look into the tears of Jesus today, we're not going to look into the tears that are filled with, with someone who is is weak and, and unwilling to do what it, what it costs to bring about our salvation. But we're going to look into the tears of someone filled with power, but willing to set that aside and humble himself and be obedient even to death. 
And those tears, those tears of Jesus, speak out more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. And we want to look at those tears today and say, what do the tears of Jesus tell us about who he is and what he's come to do for us? So we will be looking today specifically at the tears that are referred to in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. If you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, it's a New Testament book, although it sounds like Old Testament Hebrews, it's a New Testament book, and it describes Jesus Christ in so many wonderful ways. And one of the ways it describes him in, in Hebrews chapter 5 is, is Jesus and the tears that he shed. Look, if you would, at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. And on this Good Friday, we're going to focus on these tears of sorrow. It says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. What are those events that the writer of Hebrews is describing here and describing Jesus um, as having fervent cries and tears? And you think of some events that we are remembering this week that would adequately describe Jesus in that way. Perhaps we can think about the whole events of what we call the passion of the Christ, right? We could speak about the crucifixion of Jesus. And we know that there were loud cries spoken by Jesus in Matthew 27, verse 46, describing some of the seven last sayings of Jesus. One of them, which uh, Joey Robertson shared at First Baptist Church Asbury Park, did a wonderful job of describing uh, that that moment when Jesus called out. And notice what it says. Jesus cried out in a loud voice with deep cries. Do you cry out in a loud voice without tears? It doesn't say it in the text, but it certainly seems like this is an emotional moment for Jesus. And he cries out, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. In Aramaic, but in English it means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus is hanging on the cross, he cries out a cry of distress because at that moment he's experiencing the 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 God-forsakenness that He came to bear for us so that we wouldn't have to. He was forsaken of God so we could be accepted. And in that moment of of desperation, I mean, He's crying out in a loud voice. It's hard not to think that it's mixed with tears and sweat and blood as it all is uh, upon Him. Um, We often think of the events, or I won't say we often, I know that me, over over the years sometimes, I just try to make the events of the crucifixion a little less intense than they really are. About, what was it, about 2005, there was the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ. And I don't know if some of you saw that. Uh, I went to the movie theater to see it, and it was not like any other movie that you would go to. It wasn't like stand in line and get the popcorn and uh, make sure you have the soda and uh, cheer for different scenes. And, and I remember w- watching that, that story unfold and, and really just being broken to my core, watching the events described in the, the gospel in right before the screen, and if anyone ever saw that movie, I think you know the sense of dread, the sense of brokenness. And I remember at the end of the movie, as the, as the credits were rolling, you know, normally people get up and they walk out, and it was like everyone was sitting in stunned silence. I think I sat there for like 20 minutes. I didn't want to be the first one to get up. I mean, I, I, how do you respond to that, right? Um, And we kind of think of Jesus in a stoic way. When I say stoic, I mean a person who can endure pain or hardship without showing their feelings or complaining. Well, Jesus certainly didn't complain, but the Gospels present him as expressing the fullness of his humanity in loud cries. He's experiencing the passion. He wasn't stoic. Um, So perhaps the writer of Hebrews is thinking about all the events of the crucifixion. But specifically, I think the writer is speaking about the events of the Garden of Gethsemane, which would have been right after Jesus had 
instituted the Lord's Supper right after Judas was going and bringing the armies to betray Jesus. As he gathered in the garden, maybe you know that story, they reached that place in the garden and Jesus brought three of his closest disciples and he said, pray with me so that we wouldn't fall into temptation. And then he withdrew just a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and he prayed. You remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Facing the crucifixion, knowing what he was going through. He said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. This cup of wrath, of suffering. Take it from me if you're willing, but not my will, but yours be done. The most amazing prayer ever prayed on the face of the earth, I believe. This prayer of, of, of power and strength, but willing to lay it all aside. Did he pray that without tears in his eyes? It says next, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And then verse 44 says, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Is Luke describing this in a kind of metaphorical way, kind of like the way that blood drips from an open wound? But, but it really wasn't, but he's just describing it that way. Or is he describing that, you know, hematidrosis, a, a rare but, but real kind of condition in which uh, one's sweat begins to be mingled with blood because the sweat glands um, are surrounded by tiny blood vessels and under extreme duress, those, those blood vessels just sort of burst in into the sweat glands and so you're sweating but you're also bleeding at the same time. Is that what Jesus was experiencing? Were there tears mingled with that? I don't, I don't mean to be, I, I just want us to think, like, this is real. This is what Jesus went through. Jesus shed tears during his suffering to endure his suffering for us. And that's probably the event that the writer of Hebrews has in mind specifically, because if you look at it, he is saying that Jesus is, is praying these fervent cries and tears, and he's praying to the one who could save him from death. So I take it that this is the moment when he's saying, God, if there is a plan B, and Jesus knew there wasn't, but, but, he, but in his humanness, in his humanity, he recoiled at the thought of suffering. See, Jesus was not this stoic, serene person who, who was unaffected by all this. He wasn't a ghost. He was a real person. He was, re he was getting ready to experience the brutal suffering. He said, Father, one last time, not my will, but yours be done. As he faced this, and he reverently submitted to God the Father. This is, to me, these words are describing the event of the Garden of Gethsemane, the tears of Jesus flowing as he prayed this earnest prayer and yet submitted. The larger context of Hebrews chapter uh, 5 verse 7 is, is just chapter 4 verse 14 through chapter 5 verse 10 that speaks about Jesus as the high priest, the final high priest. So what Jesus is doing in the Garden of Gethsemane is, is somewhat like, and what he's going to do on the cross is somewhat like a priest of the Old Testament did. Now I know some of you are like, I, I don't know what a priest did in the Old Testament. Well, a priest represented God. A priest went into the temple and represented God. And in fact, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Every priest is selected from among the people and appointed to represent people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices. So it were these unique people who would go into the temple and offer sacrifices. They were the intermediary between the people and God. And that was the way God had set up the Old Testament system. And, and that system existed all the way through the time of Jesus. But Jesus came to be the final complete priest. No longer would a priest other than Jesus be needed. Jesus was not going to just merely offer a sacrifice of a lamb. He was going to offer himself as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Look at what it says in verse 3. That is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. The, the human priest of the old covenant was a sinner, but Jesus was this perfect Lamb of God who was offered one sacrifice to be offered. And so Jesus is getting ready to offer himself on the cross to be that final 
sacrifice, that final, and become the eternal high priest. We know we no longer need any other priest because we have Jesus Christ. I, I, I think I've shared before, but I remember one time um, early on in ministry, I was in a, a bank office. I was filling out some paperwork, and I remember the person who was taking my application said something like, so how long have you been a priest? And of course, you know, I wanted to make a theological point. Um, I wasn't too concerned about answering her question because it was right on the paper there. I'd already did, but I said, well, you have to understand that, that I, I'm not a priest. I'm a pastor. I, I, we don't need a priest any longer. But, you know, and I was, I was trying to explain to her and she just looked at me and said, so how long have you been? Uh, Like she just didn't get what I was trying to say. And and I probably didn't say it very well. But my point is I'm not a priest. I don't stand between you and God. You don't need anyone else but Jesus to stand between you and God. He is the final priest. And and that's the point that, that the writer of Hebrews is making. And he's making that point and he's saying this is what Jesus did in that moment in Garden of Gethsemane all the way to the cross. Jesus was becoming the final priest. What makes Jesus different than the priests of the old covenant? Who he is. The writer of Hebrews says during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he was human. He came and lived among us, but he was also divine. Verse 8, son though he was the eternal Son of God who existed from all eternity, who called into being the heavens and the earth, there with God the Father and the Holy Spirit from the beginning of time, three persons and one God, that person, that eternal Son, took on human flesh. And it was that Son of God and Son of Man who was walking and living among us, who was in that garden shedding real tears because he was fully human, real human tears, preparing to offer himself as the Lamb of God. This is why we need no other priest. We have the final priest, Jesus. He was the human being who lived his life on earth and still is the eternal Son of God, a human being. He is our intercessor. He's the only one who stands now for us. Because he completed the work. And and the writer of Hebrews stresses that Jesus was, was in this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. He was fulfilling the mission. It says in verse 8, he learned obedience from what he suffered. In verse 9 it says, and once made perfect. Those verses sometimes confuse people. But understand that Jesus was going through a trial. And, and the outcome was sure, but, but it was a demonstration to the world of who Jesus was. One translation says about this uh, in verse 9, it was after he had proved himself perfect. That's kind of the idea. Jesus proved himself perfect. To be that perfect final lamb, that complete person, the person who was sinless. He he overcame the curse in in the garden, in a previous garden. If you remember all the way back in the beginning, it was our, our, our forefathers who disobeyed and turned from God, disobeyed him. But it was in this garden of Gethsemane, the final garden, that Jesus obeyed and proved himself to be the rightful one, the one who would stand in our place. And so Jesus um, had to experience this suffering. Is there a sense in which Jesus learned something new about himself? Well, every time as a human being we go through experiences, we learn Jesus was fully human, but the outcome was already known. But he proved himself to be this eternal Son who took human flesh, who was able to stand in our place. He is our representative. He's the one who shows himself to be the person that we look to. And what does all that suffering mean for us? Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Because of his suffering, because of his tears that he shed, because of the suffering on the cross that he he gave because that he gave his life on the cross for us and substitution for us, He, it says in verse 9, became the source of eternal salvation for all 
who obey him. Jesus Christ, in verse 10, has been designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. He's the eternal one. That's what the order of Melchizedek means. He's the final one, and he's the high priest. He's a representative before you and God. God has designated him as such. Why? Because he withstood and completed the test, and he accomplished it all. His tears, his obedience, his suffering, all of that attests that he is the real deal and the true Messiah and the only one and the final priest that we need. And he became the source of eternal life. He's the author, it says elsewhere. He's the source. If you want eternal life, there's only one place to go. It's the only place to go. It's Jesus. If you want to have life forevermore, if you want to have the forgiveness of sins, if you want to have the assurance that you have a relationship with God. It is only through Christ. He is the source of our eternal salvation. See, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus shed tears of suffering to reveal himself as that high priest and our Savior, the one that we can trust. He was appointed by the Father to be that source of eternal life For all who trust and obey Him. How do we experience that eternal life? It says to all who will obey Him. Elsewhere in the Bible it speaks about believing in Jesus. Believing in Jesus and obeying Him really are the same thing. To turn to Jesus and put our faith and trust in Him as Lord is to say, Jesus, You are Lord. You're in charge. I bow down before You. I kneel at Your At your feet, I acknowledge that you are the sovereign one, that you're the Lord and Savior of my life, and I give my life to you. And it's in that moment of faith and trust that we discover that Jesus has done all this for us, and he becomes the source of our eternal life. Jesus shows himself through his tears and through his actions to be the one, the only one, that we can trust he's the source of eternal life. And so the tears of Jesus reveal him to be the source of our salvation and able to sympathize with us and save us from our sins. So chapter 5, verses 1 through 10 of Hebrews speaks about Jesus passing the test and proving himself authentic as the Savior. But the previous two verses tell us why it matters for us today. So we go back to Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16, we see that Jesus has... I'm going the wrong way. Uh, We see that Jesus is the one that we can trust because He is able to sympathize and identify with us. See, the tears of Jesus not only show that He accomplished what He set out to do, but that He is able to identify with us. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Just the previous verses from that section that I read. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. What are the tears of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane reveal? That Jesus knows what weakness feels like. Jesus knows what temptation feels like. The tears reveal that Jesus was undergoing an extreme temptation and trial. He didn't give in. He didn't shrink away from the will of God. He fulfilled the will of God. He proved himself to be the the high priest, the source of salvation that we can trust. But in that moment of temptation, that moment of testing, he experienced the weakness of temptation that we often experience. He experienced the the hardship of life. The tears reveal how much he went through. And what does that enable Jesus today as the risen Savior who died on the cross and rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, and now seated at the right hand of God? What does that enable Jesus to do for us? It enables him to sympathize and understand us. When we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I am just broken up over this. 
We don't have to say, but you don't know anything about that. Jesus knows. He can identify with us and we can identify with him because he is able to sympathize. The word sympathize just means simply to have similar emotion, to have a same pathos, pathos is emotion. Jesus is able to feel the pain, the temptation, the struggles that we experience because he walked in our shoes He passed the test with flying colors. And because of that, he proved himself to be the high priest that we can rely on, the only intercessor between man and God. And indeed, he proved himself. But he now has has learned and understood. And as a human being, he, he, he lives that out even today in his sympathy toward us. Jesus is that kind of a high priest. And because of that, We can have confidence, the writer of Hebrews says. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Why can we approach the throne of grace with confidence? Because we know that Jesus, our Savior, is there for us and feels what we feel and understands it and will not cast us aside if we come to him with faith and obedience, if we come to him in brokenness and say, oh God, I need you as my Savior and my Lord, he will not cast us aside. We can have confidence that we will receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus, who conquered sin and death through the suffering of the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross, who died on the cross and was buried and rose from the dead and is ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, is seated on a throne of, what does the text say? A throne of grace. What's grace? It's God's unmerited favor toward you and I as sinners. We don't deserve it. We don't merit it. We don't earn it. We can't keep it. But because of what Jesus went through and all that he experienced, we can go to that throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so the tears of Jesus, as we look and gaze into the face of the Savior and understand what he has done for us, allow us to approach him knowing that he will not turn us aside. That he will give us the grace and the mercy that we need in our time of trial. Um, we're going to start studying uh, the week after Easter, uh, the, the book called Gentle and Lowly in our, in our connection group, our, our midweek connection group. And I am just loving as I'm starting to, to read through this, just the way in which this is, challenging me to look not only to what I believe about Jesus, but who Jesus is. And in the book, he talks about how the gospel not only gives us the facts about what Jesus has done, but the very heart of Jesus. And there are times in our lives where I think we we know all the facts about Jesus, but we need to be reminded of who Jesus is the very heart of Jesus, to know his deepest heart for you and to know his longing heart for you amid your sinfulness, that Jesus wants you to come to him, that he doesn't say, oh, it's it's him again. Jesus doesn't say that about me because he, he has mercy and grace for me, the Bible says. I have to convince my mind of that, but the Bible declares that, that he is that kind of a savior And it's one thing to know the doctrines of the incarnation and the atonement and a hundred vital doctrines. And I would encourage you to know them all, to study them well, to have a clear and theological understanding of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And so if you're not clear about this, let me just simply say that Jesus' death on the cross was a substitutionary atonement, that he stood in our place, that God placed upon him 
our, the sins of those who believe in him. And he bore the full weight of those sins and paid the ultimate price, paid in full. And we can have the assurance in our mind and believe in our heart that God has forgiven us because Jesus has borne the full weight of our sin. Amen. That's the doctrine. And we should know that and believe that. But even more than that, we can see into the very heart of a Savior who was willing to do that. We can know His heart. And Jesus is that person even today. Died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of God on a throne of grace. And He has a heart toward His people that can sympathize with us because He lived among us. And when we pray to Him as His children, as His brothers and sisters and children of God the Father, He doesn't shriek away from us and say, Oh, He embraces us in our brokenness and gives us the grace and mercy that we need. Our High Priest Jesus is able to sympathize with our weakness and save all who will come to Him to experience mercy and grace. And so let me ask you today, do you know that Jesus? Do you know that Jesus who did what he did? Who, who came and lived the perfect life and died on the cross for your sins? So that if you would believe in him, you would not perish but have everlasting life. The Jesus who paid the penalty that was due your sin. Do you believe that? And do you know him, the one who did that for you? Do you want to know him more deeply? Do you want to be able to gaze into Jesus' face and see him for who he is and, and, and go to him and know that his heart is love toward you? This is the Jesus who is presented to us on Good Friday. And this is the Jesus that we can worship and adore for all eternity. It is this Jesus who is the source of salvation. And I encourage you, run to Him. Cling to Him. Embrace Him. For He alone loved you enough to endure it all for you. And He says to all who would believe, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants to offer us the rest and from the burden of our sin and the rest of eternal life through Him. For He is the source, the only source of our salvation. Are you trusting in that Jesus, in what He has done and who He is? Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that during his years on earth, he showed himself to be the perfect Lamb of God, the high priest who is the source of our salvation. We believe that and embrace that. And I invite those who have not yet believed, to consider Jesus for their lives too. But Lord, I also pray for, for myself and for your people that we would not only know the facts about Jesus and understand the great doctrine that brings us to peace with God and we would dwell on that and understand that, but also experience in reality the person who brings that to us May we have a greater sense of who Jesus is and adore him and love him and be loved by him. For his heart is toward those who cling to him. For we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.